Thank you to uh, Mary Grace for inviting me to the Sussex Library. My name is Evan Wiener. Uh, I have been doing this type of thing since I'm 15 years old in 1971, starting out on radio on WRKL Radio in Mount Ivy, New York in Rockland County. And uh, I also, at the same time, I was a high school student, Joe Dionisio was my teacher, and he opened up the doors for me uh, at WRKL, at the Nyack Journal News and the Bergen Record. Uh, I made it on to WNEW AM radio when I was 21 years old, William B. Williams and, and uh, that gang uh, doing news, all because John Lindsay told me he was running for Senate uh, in New York in 1980, and that opened the door for uh, me in the radio career, and uh, I am forever thankful that John Lindsay told me that, and gave me a scoop. And there I was at 21, ready to go. And I bring up Lindsay because you're gonna see John Lindsay in this 1965 talk. 1965, that's Lyndon Johnson's full term, first year of his full term after he wins the election in 1964. Martin Luther King is uh, still uh, looking for civil rights. Uh, he is going around the South uh, protesting. And take a look behind Martin Luther King's shoulder, his right shoulder, television, television. One big thing on the civil rights movement starting in 1963 was television went to cover what was going on with Martin Luther King and other protesters in the South. That's uh, Malcolm X after he shot in Harlem, actually in Washington Heights, uh, in February of 1965, shot and killed. The Voters' Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, signed into law in 1965, and there was Martin Luther King with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, that's Watts, the rioting in uh, Watts in Los Angeles in the summer of 1965, and the omnipresent in the 1960s Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War was escalated in August of 1964 by Lyndon Johnson uh, when he was given permission by Congress, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to do whatever it took to make sure that the North Vietnamese, the communists were defeated in Indochina, French Indochina in 1954, at that point, North and South Vietnam. And there were rallies as well, anti-war rallies, this one in Washington, DC. The Dominican Republic, that was occupied by the United States in 1965. Why? Because the United States did not want another Cuba on its hands. The Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 was signed over at uh, the Statue of Liberty and uh, there's John Lindsay, the tall guy in the last row looking uh, to his right uh, at the ceremony. Lyndon Johnson uh, was saw or signed it into law. And uh, there was Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, the senator from New York, Ted Kennedy, the senator from Massachusetts, uh, all there witnessing Johnson signing that law. The Great Society. Something Lyndon Johnson talked about in 1964, that he had this vision of the great society. By the way, the Daily News was seven cents in those days, um, seven cents. The great society, the State of the Union Address, and Lyndon Johnson laid out his blueprint for how he envisioned American society from 1965 onward. There would be billions of dollars thrown into school age, senior citizens would get Medicare. There would also be Medicaid. There would be a war on poverty. And this was all laid out in the State of the Union Address in 1965. Uh, the State of the Union Address called for the creation, what would become Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, the Voting Rights Act, all part of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act and Head Start. Department of Housing and Urban Development and uh, Lady Bird Johnson, she had something that uh, she wanted, uh, which was to beautify America, take billboards off roads, plant flowers and things on highways, uh, the White House Conference on Natural Beauty. But even though Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law in July of 1964, there were civil rights problems, Jim Crow problems, and this particular problem in New Orleans involving the American Football League All-Stars, 
36 hour event leads in a way to the formation of the Super Bowl. It was 1964, after the 1964 season, the American Football League, that was the league that Joe Namath would join in 1965. The American Football League uh, would hold an all-star game or wanted to hold an all-star game in New Orleans. And the purpose was to announce that New Orleans was going to get a team at halftime. Jim Crow was gone. Civil Rights Act was going to enforce laws, particularly in the South, in places like New Orleans. But still in 1965 in New Orleans, if you were Negro or colored uh, and you wanted to get a cab, you couldn't get a cab. You had to have a white guy go with you in the cab if you wanted a cab. Cabbies did not pick up colored people. Uh, the American Football League had 22 Negroes on their team in 1965 playing in the All-Star game. And uh, it was arranged that um, the players would get cabs. They could go to hotels freely. They could dine freely in New Orleans. It wasn't going to be any problem. After all, New Orleans wanted a team. This is a protest that nobody talks about. Um, you find the protest in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. There is no Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. involved. There's no Southern Christian leadership involved. There's no SNCC involved. John Lewis isn't involved. It's just the football players. And there are the uh, AFL All-Stars. Uh, January 9th, 1965, the boycott. Uh, the guy uh, with the uh, hat with tickets in his hand is Curtis McClinton, who played with Kansas City. Butch Bird, who played with Buffalo, is there. And these guys are waiting for cabs. 22 guys waiting for cabs. Uh, and the cabs never came. Um, Ron Mix, who I know, he's about 83 years old now, and still an attorney in, um, in um, San Diego. And uh, he was telling me, this was in 2014, with the NBA problem with the Los Angeles Clippers owner, Donald Sterling, um, telling his mistress that he didn't want her around African-American uh, men. Uh, and if she was going to do so, don't do it here uh, at the basketball games. Don't take her to an NBA game that my team is playing, Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, and I called Ron and I wanted to know about uh, if there was any comparison between what was going on there. The Clippers players threatened to strike uh, if Donald Sterling was not removed as the owner. He was removed a couple of days later after the advertiser said, we don't want him. We're taking money out when money talks. When money talks, nobody walks. Anyway, I was talking to Ron about 1965 and 2014. And I said, what, was there a difference? He said, there was a difference. He said, we were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game to demonstrate to the American Football League and National Football League that they, New Orleans, could support the football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was a system in demonstrating that they could support the franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players. Cookie Gilchrist played with the Buffalo Bills, and he was the guy who got everybody together to talk about let's boycott this game because of the treatment. New Orleans leaders said the city was going to welcome the AFL All-Stars, 22 black players with open arms. Segregation, thing of the past. Jim Crow, thing of the past. And we desperately want this football team. We want this football team. Uh, the American Football League in 1964 was the only league going into 1965 to truly embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field with white players. National Football League scouts went to watch players from the big time schools, which were Michigan and Alabama, uh, Notre Dame and uh, University of Mississippi. Uh, those schools in the South did not have black players. Uh, as late as 1963, George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, said he was going to block African Americans from attending the University of Alabama. So the good players, the really good players, went to places like Grambling in Louisiana or Bethune-Cookman or Prairie View or Morgan State, uh, Texas A&I. Uh, and that's where the American Football League looked for players. And they got players. They got really good players. Uh, ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed black college football programs as the best players could actually attend. 
Alabama or Mississippi or Louisiana State or Texas or Georgia or South Carolina. Um, so Eddie Robinson and Grambling lost the best players like Ernie Land and uh, uh, Buck Buchanan. That's my friend, Abner Haynes. He lives in Dallas. He's about 83, 84 years old now. And uh, Abner played with the Kansas City Chiefs and he was an all-star and his owner, Lamar Hunt, told him along with David Grayson, his teammate, name, rank, and serial number when you get to New Orleans. It's all you need to tell him. Abner Haynes, running back Kansas City Chiefs, American Football League all-star member. And Abner talked about eventually getting the cabs. They sent out the colored cabs, as they were called. The colored cabs went, picked up the black players. Cookie Gilchrist actually was in uh, at the Hotel Roosevelt because Jack Kemp, who ran for vice president in 1996, Jack Kemp took him into the cab with him. He was the president of the American Football League Players Association. And he told the players, whatever you do, I have your back, which was mighty noble of Jack because Jack was a Barry Goldwater uh, supporter in 1964 and also campaigned for him in Western New York. Uh, so he put not only his professional football career on the line, but his pro football career on the line, uh, rather his pol uh, political career on the line. So Abner tells the story. This is uh, in January 1965. There's the old hand cranked elevator at uh, the Hotel Roosevelt. And he said there was an elderly white woman who was uh, running uh, the elevator, doing the crank, opening the gate, and the door flings open. And she sees Abner and David Grayson. And she says, Hey, monkeys, what are you doing here? Abner uh, said, um, name, rank, and serial number. They had a woman operating the elevator and she said, you monkeys, come on in, get to the back. Finally, there were about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We're talking sensibly, we're gonna stay together. This was just another test. Abner was the first African-American player to play college football on a regular basis in Texas. He endured the green book treatment when his team uh, played in the deep south uh, and he was separated from the rest of uh, his teammates and they did the green book, got him a bus, showed them where he had to stay, showed them where he could eat. And that happened as recently as 1965. We had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we we're playing for progress. Football players took the lead. He's wrong about that because Rosa Parks took the lead back in 1955, but he was right about football players because this was really the first time they stood up on mass and protested something. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us. One of those guys, Jack Kemp. That's me and Jack in 1979. We had a relationship until uh, he passed away in 2009. That's in Spark Hill, New York in 1979, May of 1979. Me, I'm 23, interviewing Jack. Jack saw that picture later on in life. He said, what happened to your hair? I said, what happened to your wig? It's white now. We retired to get a drink after that. Uh, one of the things Abner said was the AFL needed the unity of the white and black players for our league. When the white players, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City defensive leader and four or five other guys heard about what was happening, their character showed my teammates were looking after me. They picked up, they went to Houston. Eventually the American Football League and National Football League would merge. New Orleans would become a problem. Uh, Russell Long in Louisiana held Boggs in Louisiana from the Senate and the House didn't want to vote for the merger. They traded, they, the NFL, traded the team in exchange for a whole bunch of votes. And that leads to the Super Bowl. This is the first step that led to the Super Bowl. It also tells you a little bit about what was going on in the civil rights movement at the time. Uh, eventually the civil, uh, rather the Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. A couple of weeks later in Selma, Alabama, trouble starts. And this would trouble would last for a while. John Lewis would say the good kind of trouble. Selma, 1965, February 1965. February 1st, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 700 demonstrators are arrested in Selma. Why Selma, Alabama of all places? Why Selma? Well, in 1950, African Americans made up about a half of Dallas County, which is where Selma is in Alabama, 
about half of Dallas County's voting age population. But since 1901, they couldn't vote because of poll taxes. By the way, poll taxes were not outlawed in the United States until January of 1964. Constitutional amendment, January of 1964, still poll taxes and literacy taxes enacted by the Alabama state constitution. In 1961, only 156 of Dallas County's 15,000 voting age African-Americans were registered. Uh, a name forgotten in history, long forgotten in history, is Jim Clark. He was the local sheriff. When African-Americans attempted to vote, Clark, who was an art and segregationist, would harass them. Several occasions assaulted voting organizers. The effort to extend the voting rights to all citizens began in Selma long before 1965. The Dallas County Voters League uh, worked to add African-American voters to the rolls in the late 1950s, early 1960s through voter registration classes. In 1963, John Lewis's group, Congressman John Lewis, who was still uh, a college student in 1963, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, took note of the grassroots efforts of the DCVL and came to Selma to join the cause. So things are beginning to happen in Selma. Uh, John Lewis was one of Martin Luther King's protégés. So he puts out a call to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is headed by King, looking for help. And there is Sheriff Jim Clark, long forgotten in history, but a key point or a key part of history. Early in 1965, King defied an injunction against large gatherings so he could address a mass rally at the Brown Chapel AME Church. A few days later, 400 joined the first voter registration march to the Dallas County Courthouse. Jim Clark was having none of it absolutely none of it. So he directed the marchers to an alley and none of them were allowed to register. So flashpoints are beginning to show up here in Selma. The next day, the protesters refused to stand in an alley and Clark ordered them to disperse. Uh, the DCVL organizer, Amelia Boynton, responded too slowly to his order. Clark grabbed her collar, shoved her into a patrol car, arrested her along with 67 other marchers. Uh, a few miles from Selma was, is Perry County, Alabama, equal rights advocates met in Marion, Alabama at a church. Uh, and they were concerned about a local organizer, uh, Boynton being jailed. The demonstrators decided to march for justice that night in defiance of the town ordinance. The governor, George Wallace, who was a segregationist who did not run as a segregationist for governor in the late 1950s, but did in the early 1960s. Uh, he dispatched uh, state troopers from Montgomery to get rid of the marchers. They wanted to quell whatever was going on uh, in Selma, Alabama. Here's another guy who is lost in history, but he's an important guy in history. His name, Jimmy Lee Jackson. And Jimmy Lee Jackson gets shot. An Alabama state trooper shoots him in a cafe near the town center on February 18th, 1965. Eight days later, he, he dies. His death becomes a rallying cry and further emboldened demonstrators to seek justice. There was a call to carry Jackson's body from that area to the state capitol in Montgomery and lay it on the state capitol steps. And this would become a memorial march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery. And George Wallace was going to stop it. Meanwhile, as this is all going on in Alabama, over in Washington Heights in the Bronx, Malcolm X is shot and killed on February 21st, 1965. Malcolm X is a polarizing figure in the civil rights movement. Uh, he was a small time hoodlum in Boston in the 1940s, uh, but he embraced um, the teachings of Reverend uh, Herbert Muhammad uh, and the Black Muslims. Uh, Malcolm X was an African-American nationalist and was a religious leader. 
and he was assassinated by a rival black, black Muslim group while addressing his organization, the Organization of Afro, Afro American Unity at the Audubon Ballroom in Washington Heights. At the age of 21, Malcolm was sent to prison on a burglary conviction. He started reading the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, who was the leader of the Nation of Islam, whose members were popularly known as Black Muslims. The Nation of Islam advocated Black nationalism, which was an idea that was put forth by W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Du Bois rather, uh, in the 19 teens. Um, and uh, racial separatism, which uh, W.E.B. did not call for. It condemned Americans of European descent as immoral devils. And there is Malcolm X and there is Elijah Muhammad uh, in days when uh, they talked to one another briefly. Uh, in the early 1960s, Malcolm X started deviating from Elijah Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad he thought was not supporting the civil rights movement. One of Malcolm X's protégés was a guy by the name of Cassius Clay. In 1963, after the uh, assassination of President Kennedy, uh, Malcolm X said that uh, this was a matter of the chickens coming home to roost. And that got Elijah Muhammad very, very upset when he said that. And um, he thought, he was beginning to think anyway, Malcolm was becoming too powerful and he suspended him from the Nation of Islam. So he's out there um, no longer supported by uh, Elijah Muhammad and he goes off on his own and he goes to Saudi Arabia and he goes to Mecca. And he saw white Muslims there and he noticed a lack of racial discord among the Orthodox Muslims and he comes back to America as a changed man with a new name, El Haj Malik Al Shabazz. And in June of 1964, he he's the founder of the Organization of Afro American Unity, which advocated black identity, but held that racism not the white race, racism altogether was the greatest foe of African-Americans. Meanwhile, John Lewis, who would eventually become a congressman, his group, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNAC, uh, became interested in Malcolm X's new philosophy. Uh, Malcolm X was running into all sorts of problems. His home in Queens was firebombed a week before his assassination. Uh, he and his wife, Betty Shabazz, uh, were inside and four of their children were asleep. No one was ever charged related to that incident. It is still an open case, or maybe it's just a cold case now, now, as far as New York City PD is concerned. Who really killed Malcolm X? That's a question that seems to have never been answered. Uh, decades later, Actually, this year, Netflix put out a documentary called Who Killed Malcolm X? It came out February 7th of 2020. And basically, they're trying to get New York City to reopen the investigation of what exactly happened that day when Malcolm X was shot and killed in Washington Heights. On June 6, 1964, the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, sent a telegram which later became public to his office in New York City. And he said, do something about Malcolm X. Something was done, but by whom? It's a great question. Yeah, people were arrested and charged with the murder, but were they the right people? There are still some people who 55 years later want to know what really happened that day. Meanwhile, back in Alabama, there is John Lewis, and John Lewis is about ready or going to try to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Edmund Pettus was a KKK member. Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, the Reverend Hosea Williams and John Lewis, the leader of SNCC, walked from the pulpit of Brown Chapel with a crowd of about 600 people heading to Montgomery. And remember, they are not in Selma at this point or the unincorporated Dallas County in Alabama. Just six blocks from the bridge 
they started walking toward the bridge into Selma. Television was there. Television becomes a critical part of the civil rights movement because in 1963, first weekend in May, uh, the cameras were there during what was the Birmingham riot and they caught what was going on and it was on Cronkite and it was on Huntley Brinkley and it was on Howard K. Smith on ABC News and it was on the cover of the New York Times which got John Kennedy's attention and he started to look into the civil rights movement more seriously than he did in 1961 and 1962. That was May of 1963. Here we're all set up for the confrontation, the Alabama State Police and the protesters. Upon reaching the apex, the marchers got their first glimpse of what Lewis would later describe as a sea of blue. On orders from Wallace, the Alabama State Troopers blocked US Highway 80. Lewis and Williams stopped the marchers just short of the troopers' formation and asked for a meeting with the troopers' leaders. They said no. Instead, they got greeted with tear gas. That was uh, March the 7th. The troopers gave the marchers two minutes to disperse, or if they returned, they were going to get hit with tear gas. Uh, the marchers stood resolute. The troopers attacked. News cameras caught every gruesome detail of the attack and broadcast the footage, not only in the United States, but around the globe. And around the globe at this point, South Africa was taking a beating because of apartheid. Um, and South Africa was indeed thrown out of the Olympic movement in 1964 because of apartheid. This is coming out of the United States South. And there is John Lewis uh, being hit over the head with a baton uh, near the bridge. When he passed away this year, uh, his body went from Alabama to his burial in Georgia. He went through the bridge and all of the Alabama state troopers saluted him as his first went by. After Bloody Sunday, Dr. King, Martin Luther King, put out a call to the clergy from all over the country, then come down to Selma and join the people in Selma for another march. A federal district judge by the name of Frank Johnson said no to the plans. He issued an injunction against any march until there was a hearing take place if the march could take place. Uh, Dr. King agreed to march, but only to the far side of the bridge, not going over the bridge, they did that as a showing of strength. Uh, on March 9th, 2000 people approached the troopers across the same ground. The leaders kneeled in prayer, stood up, turned around, walked back to Selma. That night, the territorian clergyman who had marched, uh, the Reverend James Reed, was attacked and later died. Dr. King spoke at the funeral, asking, why must good men die for doing good? There is George Wallace. George Wallace is definitely standing his ground in Alabama. As the marchers prepared to embark for Montgomery, Wallace refused to provide state protection. Lyndon Johnson then gets involved. He federalizes the Alabama National Guardsmen and sent an array of federal troops and agents to protect the marchers. marchers. Meanwhile, there's a problem in the Dominican Republic. The Monroe Doctrine kicks in. Now, in 1961, the United States tried to invade Cuba with the Bay of Pigs. That was a dismal failure, and Castro was able to solidify his control, uh, Fidel Castro. Um, the United States did not want to see a repeat of this in the Dominican Republic in 1965. On April 28th, 22,000 troops landed in the Dominican Republic. Over the next few weeks, they brought an end to fighting and installed a conservative non-military government. It all starts when the civilian and military supporters of the former president, Juan Bosch, overthrew acting president Donald Reed at Cabral. U.S. troops remained in the country and stabilized the country until 1966. Summer begins. It's a year after the Civil Rights Act is passed. But um, there are people who want to return to the way of life prior to the Civil Rights Act. And uh, here's how the summer begins in North Carolina. 
KKK, cross burning. The Voters' Rights Act of 1965 is signed into law by Lyndon Johnson. And there is Martin Luther King, who seemed to be spending a lot of time at the White House congratulating Lyndon Johnson and getting a pen for uh, his efforts. But uh, his efforts did get a Civil Rights Act passed in 64, Voters' Rights Act passed in 1965. Uh, and Dr. King and other civil rights leaders were there August 6th, 1965. But as that's going on, there's trouble in Los Angeles, in the Watts area of Los Angeles, as you can see, Hudson Shoes there is burning down. This is August 11th, 1965, and it's called the Watts Rebellion or the Watts Riot. It lasts about six days, 34 deaths. There are body counts here, 34 deaths, 1,032 injuries, 4,000 arrests, 34,000 people are involved the destruction of 1,000 buildings. Uh, Marquette and Ronald Fry were pulled over by a white chips officer, California patrol officer, at, near the corner of Avalon Boulevard and 116th Street. Uh, Marquette failed the sobriety test and he panicked as he was arrested. Uh, Marquette's anger rose at the thought of going to jail. A fight breaks out between him and one of the officers and the riot would ensue. There's Vons. Vons is still around, the Vons uh, supermarkets uh, in uh, California. I think they're owned by Albertson or the parent company has Albertson as well, or maybe Safeway. Anyway, there are the uh, state troopers patrolling the streets of Watts. Uh, most of the 34 dead were black citizens, two policemen, one firefighter among the casualties. Uh, 26 deaths, mostly the result of the Los Angeles Police Department or National Guard actions were deemed justifiable homicides. Uh, afterwards, afterwards, there were all kind of com community meetings. How do we improve our situation here? How do we improve our schools? How do we get more employment here? How do we improve housing? Uh, how do we get better health care and how do we fix up the relationship with the police departments? Uh, unfortunately, nothing happened. A lot of talk, nothing at all happened in 1965. Meanwhile, Johnson wants to get the Great Society up and going, and he does so. What became of the Great Society? Well, Medicare. People over 65 had health insurance for the first time in the country. Medicaid, people who were disabled, who couldn't work, were able to get Medicaid. Uh, Medicare covered hospital and physician costs for elderly who qualified. There was no more bartering. There was no more saving up your money for your old age so you could pay for your health care. You could now get the government to pay for your health care. Medicaid covered health costs for people getting cash assistance from the government. Both programs served as safety nets for America's most vulnerable. Now, John Kennedy was interested in doing this in 1961. And even though Kennedy was part of the Senate, he had been the senator from Massachusetts, um, he decided not to propose this legislation because he didn't think he had any support in the Senate. Kennedy didn't have or didn't put forth much legislation, even though he was a senator, because he never thought he had all that much support in the Senate for anything he wanted to do. Uh, Head Start program was started as an eight week summer camp run by the Office of Economic Opportunity for 500,000 children ages three to five. In 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was passed. That was uh, pushed through the house by Edith Green who is a Senate, or rather a Congresswoman from Oregon, the fourth district. Uh, Edith Green was known as the mother of education. She got to the Congress in 1955 and worked basically on women's and children's uh, issues. Uh, the uh, 65 Act guaranteed federal funding for education in school districts whose student majority was low income. Uh, the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1965 provided federal funds to cities for urban renewal and development. Uh, for cities to receive the funds, they had to establish minimum housing standards. In 1965, because of Lady Bird Johnson, Johnson signed the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act. It declared, 
the arts and humanities belong to all the people of the United States and that culture is, not, is a concern of the government, not just a concern of private citizens uh, like Frick, who has the Frick Museum in Manhattan, or Carnegie, who built libraries, or, or other donors uh, to the arts, patrons of the arts, that the government should be involved in helping. Although I'm not sure how much it helped with Andy Warhol's Campbell soup can, uh, or the Brillo boxes that you can see at the Princeton Art Museum. So I thought I saw that at Costco. I walk into the Princeton Art Museum, there's a Brillo box. Uh, for the environment, Johnson signed the Water Quality Act in 1965 to help set national water quality standards. He also, in 1965, signed the Motor Vehicle Air Pollution Control Act form. It was the first vehicle emission standards ever applied to the auto industry. The Immigration and Naturalization Act was passed in October 1965. It ended immigration nationality quotas, although it focused really on reunited families, uh, but it also placed limits on immigrants per country as was done in 1924 and total immigration. Um, the Immigration Act of 1924 basically cut off Eastern Europeans from coming to the United States. That's what it was aimed at in 1924, those immigrants from those Eastern European countries. Meanwhile, the war in Vietnam is growing and growing and growing. Johnson got the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in August 1964, and it was his war now, his war, his generals, and they decided to send more and more and more troops to Vietnam, both men and women. Uh, I did a 1968 talk, and there was a woman who said, you have to include women. There were women who were doing administration tasks or other things like being nurses and were in harm's way. So there were both men and women. In fact, uh, uh, the first uh, woman uh, who was killed in Vietnam was in 1965, and she was a journalist by the name of Dickie Chappelle. And she was killed covering the war. She was the first journalist killing, uh, killed in the war. And uh, she had been arrested uh, during the Hungarian invasion in 1956. She was all over the world uh, at trouble spots. And she ended up in Vietnam. Uh, and she was buried with full military honors. Vietnam, January 1st, there were 23,310 military men and women in Vietnam. North Vietnam and the United States would rapidly increase the number of troops in South Vietnam in 1965. The first break with Johnson is on January 3rd, 1965. The Montana Democrat, the Senator Mike Mansfield, appeared on the Sunday morning shows and said the neutralization of South Vietnam through an agreement reached by negotiators between the US and the communist powers might be the best solution to the war. The war would drag on almost eight years to the day that Mansfield made that statement. February 9th, Mao Zedong gets involved and China. Now there's no relationship between uh, red China or communist China as my ninth grade teacher, Stewie Gates said in 1969-70, Stewie's still around, still with the Stony Point Fire Department. He's in his nineties now doesn't climb ladders anymore. Anyway, uh, Stony Point, New York, that is. The People's Republic of China, Mao Zedong, issued a statement, we warn U.S. imperialism, you are overreaching yourselves in trying to extend the war with your small forces in Indochina, Southeast Asia, and the Far East. To be frank, we are waiting for you in battle array. Uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy, told Mansfield that the Johnson administration was willing to run the risk of a war with China if an invasion of North Vietnam was deemed necessary. So uh, three years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, here's the United States maybe on the brink of a war with Red or Communist China. Meanwhile, there are protests in the street. This woman, Alex Hers in Detroit, Alex Hers, uh, puts herself on fire. She's 82 years old. She stands on the corner of Grand River Avenue in Oakman Boulevard in Detroit, douses herself with two cans of a flammable cleaning fluid, sets herself ablaze in the protest. 
I choose the illuminating death of a Buddhist to protest against a great country trying to wipe out a small country for no reason. She dies of her burns 10 days later. Meanwhile, the uh, Washington Post columnist Walter Lippmann said of the escalation of the war that it was going to be a disaster. For this country to involve itself in such a war in Asia would be an act of supreme folly. College teach-ins. There were college teach-ins like this one at UCLA, March 25th, 1965. Actually, it was the first college teach-in. Um, or is the second one, actually. The first one was at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor on March 17th, 1965. And it was a concept that uh, of the teaching that was developed by a guy by the name of Marshall Salings uh, during a meeting, March 17th, 1965. Previously, about 50 faculty members signed on to a one-day teaching strike to oppose the Vietnam War. There would be 35 more teach-ins on college campuses within the next week. By the end of the school year, there had been teachings at 120 campuses around the country. The first real college campus uh, eruption was at the University of Wisconsin in February 1967. And that wasn't necessarily against the Vietnam War per se. It was against Dow Chemical for making Agent Orange and Dow Chemical coming onto the University of Wisconsin campus to recruit scientists for other things, not just Agent Orange and the campus erupted. Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong. Ho Chi Minh on the left, Mao Zedong on the right discussing what was going to happen with communist Red China and the communist North Vietnamese. The North Vietnamese, according to an agreement that was reached on May 16th, the North Vietnamese would fight a proxy war with America. Uh, the North Vietnamese would fight the war with Chinese logistical help, but the Chinese would not come in militarily unless the United States invaded North Vietnam. The assistance to Vietnam took, North Vietnam took three forms, engineers, laborers to build and maintain defense works, airfields and roads, anti-aircraft personnel to defend North Vietnam from airstrikes and military equipment. Meanwhile, remember burning your draft cards. It was a big deal, burning your draft cards. Well, this guy, David Miller, was the first guy to do it, and he does it in New York City. David Miller, a Catholic uh, pacifist burnt his draft card during an anti-war rally in New York City organized by the Catholic Worker Movement. It was on October 15th that he did so. On October 18th, he was arrested by the FBI under a new federal law that made the defacement of a Selective Service information card punishable as a crime. He would later serve 22 months in prison. In 1967, in Central Park, there was a mass burning of draft cards dumped into a Maxwell House coffee can, April 15th, 1967. Meanwhile, and Bruce Morton is in this room, and Bruce and I were discussing this last night. He said, for your 1965 talk, Bruce worked at ABC Radio when I was working at Mutual Radio in the 1980s. He said, is the eve of destruction in your talk? I said, no. He said, well, it was in 1965. And he convinced me, you know what? This is probably a good thing for this talk. I mean, uh, look at some of the other songs there. Hang on, Sloopy, Help, The In Crowd with Ramsey Lewis. It Ain't Me, Babe, Bob Dylan. So there's a whole cross section of hits. Um, the Beatles are in there and Bob Dylan is in there and, uh, and uh, Sonny and Cher, I Got You and Unchained Melody, The Righteous Brothers but Barry McGuire, Eve of Destruction, is on top of the charts. Some of the uh, lyrics here, you're old enough to kill, but not for voting. And that referred to the United States law requiring registration for the draft at the age of 18. The minimum voting age was 21, except in four states. Uh, in July, 1971, a constitutional amendment changed the vote to 18 because people were going to Vietnam and couldn't vote on the people who were sending them to Vietnam. And even the Jordan Rivers has bodies floating, uh, the war over water. If the, but, if the button is pushed, there's no running away. 
nuclear war at any moment. Uh, the song mentions Selma, Alabama, and uh, it was rewritten. It was originally written in 1964. It was rewritten in 1965 uh, after the birds turned it down. Flo and Eddie, or the turtles, uh, the turtles did a version of the show. I knew Jim Ponce, who was the bass player for the turtles, who ended up working in the NFL as a film guy for the New York Jets. Anyway, uh, the song mentions Selma, Alabama, and that uh, talks about the Selma to uh, Montgomery marches and Bloody Sunday. Um, you may leave here for four days in space, but when you return, it's the same old place, the Gemini 4 mission, uh, the United States getting back into the manned space race with the Gemini program in 1965. That was a four-day mission. The lyric, pounding of drums, the pride and disgrace refers to the Kennedy assassination and the funeral uh, on November 25th, 1963, which featured muffled drum uh, sounds as the casket is taken to Arlington National Cemetery. Meanwhile, Lyndon Johnson is looking at the war and he's got a Christmas Eve present for everybody. Here he is at the LBJ ranch in 1965. Uh, he announces that there would be a halt in the bombing of North Vietnam and he's asking people around the world, help us, help us, persuade North Vietnam. Let's do a negotiation to the end of the war. Robert McNamara, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, one of the architects of the Vietnam War between the Kennedy administration to the beginning of the Nixon administration, January 20th, 1969, and the Defense Department opposed the bombing halt. On December 31st, 1965, there were 184,314 military people in South Vietnam, compared to 23,310, 365 days earlier. Casualties, 1,928 dead, 216 in 1964. In 1965, the United States drafted 230,991 men compared to 112,386 in 1964. The Vietnam War was going into 1966. Colonialism was ending in Africa. Gambia achieved independence on February 18, 1965. It was a constitutional monarchy within the British Commonwealth. Queen Elizabeth is the Queen of Gambia. She's also the Queen of Canada, even though Canada is more or less an independent country. And uh, Gambia is represented by a uh, governor general. Rhodesia becomes a problem. Uh, Ian Smith, he is the prime minister of Rhodesia. And Ian Smith on November 11th, uh, the Rhodesian government led by Ian Smith severs its links with the British crown. British authorities were really, really upset. Uh, they were prepared prepared to allow independence uh, on giving the black majority a fair share of power. Ian Smith wanted no part of it. So the Brits put sanctions onto uh, the Rhodesians uh, and basically it was designed to uh, choke off Rhodesia's imports of oil and exports of uh, vital cash crop tobacco. But that wasn't really a problem because you see Rhodesia share the border with South Africa, apartheid South Africa. So the sanctions were unenforceable. Uh, this would last for years and years and years and years. The Beatles at Shea Stadium. Now, this is a legendary concert that most people who were at Shea Stadium that night, 55,000 people, couldn't hear. Ringo Starr couldn't hear it. And he was the drummer, and he was sitting only a few weeks, a few feet away. It was billed as the great outdoor concert at a baseball stadium or a football stadium, except the Beatles did that in 1964. Charles Finley, the owner of the Kansas City Athletics of the American League, Major League Baseball. Charles O. Finley is pleased to present for the enjoyment of the Beatles fans in mid-America, Kansas City, the Beatles in person. And I think McCartney did Kansas City in Kansas City. Thursday, September 14th, 1964, rain or shine. It's one of the reasons the Beatles quit touring. They were almost electrocuted in the stadium uh, during a rainstorm. Uh, no refunds. It only cost $4.50 to see the Beatles or hear the screaming. 
uh, September 17th, 1964. Uh, the Beatles did not sell out Kansas City, 20,207 there, about 15,000 empty seats. But 55,000 saw the Beatles at Shea Stadium, Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan introduced them. Jerry Stiller is my cousin. Well, I do a TV talk. I tell you stories about uh, Sullivan that Jerry Stiller told me. Uh, but it was the biggest crowd for a rock concert. Nobody heard them. Meanwhile, back in the USSR, you like that segue, right? ICBM's 20th anniversary of VE Day, uh, the day that uh, the Germans surrendered and uh, the Soviets showing off their muscle with uh, their ICBM, which actually launched Sputnik back in 1957, 58. Uh, and here they are, Red Square, and here goes a missile through Red Square. The space race is heating up. Space race was not necessarily who gets to the moon first, but who controls space. But it was sold to us as who gets to the moon first. Uh, Ranger 8. Uh, takes pictures before crashing onto the lunar surface. That is uh, one of the first uh, spacecrafts that uh, America sends up that reaches the lunar surface. America is back in space. March 18, 1965, the Soviets get the first uh, spacewalk on Vashkak 2. Uh, March 23rd, Gemini 3, Gus Grissom and uh, John Young are uh, in that flight, uh, the first American flight in almost two years uh, with men. First spacewalk by an American, Ed White, Gemini 4. Uh, that's June 3rd, 1965. Uh, the fir first Mars flyby, Mariner 4, by NASA in uh, July 1965. Eight days uh, in space. Gordon Cooper, along with uh, uh, Charles Conrad, uh, August 29th, 1965. There's a rendezvous between Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. Uh, and uh, Gemini 7, December 18th, 1965, Frank Borman and Tom Hanks, I mean, Jim Lovell, uh, 14 days, Tom Hanks played Jim Lovell in Apollo 13, 14 day human space flight record. Uh, there was another war between India and Pakistan in 1965 that starts on August 5th. Uh, there would be a ceasefire brokered by the UN on September 22nd, the US supported India, Soviet Union was behind Pakistan, so more Cold War tension uh, here. And uh, even though there was a truce, the tension would not ease and would not ease until 1971. On October 1st, six Indonesian generals are killed by the September 30th movement during a uh, coup d'etat attempt, later blamed on the Communist Party of Indonesia, mass killings of suspected communists would begin shortly thereafter. Um, the United States is not done with Cubans. It's been quite a while since the Bay of Pigs, over four years at this point. But if Cubans wanted to leave uh, Cuba and live in America, Americans uh, airlifted them out of Cuba. The Maple Leaf, the Maple Leaf, that's up in, uh, where is it? Nova Scotia. Uh, the Maple Leaf becomes the symbol of Canada. No more beaver, no more Union Jack. The maple leaf is on the Canadian flag. Oh, Canada. The maple leaf becomes Canada's new national symbol. Some of you might remember the November 9th blackout. 30 million people, both in the United States and uh, in Canada, because a wire went, <laughs> because somebody couldn't fix a wire properly. So the whole Northeast and parts of Canada went. 30 million people. I remember that night. It's Tuesday night. We didn't know what to do. Finally, you know, hey, a lot of you probably have this today, a smartphone. Well, that's one of the first smartphones in West Germany in 1965. Uh, he probably can't see her, but she could see him. The legacy of 1965 as we watch a South Vietnam Army member punch out a Viet Cong guy. Walt Disney used the New York City World's Fair, which closed in 1965, um, as sort of a, a test ground for what would become Walt Disney World. Uh, he put It's a Small World in the 1964 uh, World's Fair. It was very popular in 64 and 65, packed it up, sent it out to Disneyland in Anaheim. Uh, he also had, uh, he saw the uh, Illinois Pavilion, which had uh, Mr. Lincoln talking to you. He thought that was cool. 
So at that point, he decided to make there were really four other guys, because Grover Cleveland served twice uh, as president, uh, non-consecutive terms. He decided to make figures of them, made them talk. That would go down to uh, Disney World, which uh, eventually would open after Walt's death in 1971. Some of you who may have gone to the World's Fair probably didn't know it was a money loser. Robert Moses uh, thought that they would get 70 million dollars or 70 million customers. Uh, the first year, they got 50 million. He had to borrow money from the exhibitors uh, who were returning in 1965 to pay off the 64 debt. Uh, the New York Pavilion is still around. It was used men in black, uh, and they're trying to rebuild it. Uh, and that's part of the Sinclair uh, Pavilion. And uh, goodbye, Dino Dinosaur. Uh, most of the World's Fair was gone by 1966. John Lewis's funeral. Um, that was this year. John Lewis was able to get across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and he got a salute from the Alabama State Troopers as his body went by them. Another legacy, 2013, the Voting Rights Act is undone by uh, the Supreme Court by a five to four uh, vote. Um, John Roberts did the uh, writing on this. In 2013, the Supreme Court's five-member conservative majority gutted the Voting Rights Act, and they ruled states with a long history of racial discrimination in their conduct of elections no longer needed to clear changes to voting rights laws with the federal government, holding that things have changed dramatically since the act was passed in 1965. There probably are some people who disagree with Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, and that court decision. And that was the year that was. Well, that's from 1980 when uh, I was out on the campaign trail interviewing people like Reagan and Kennedy and uh, covering mostly the New York State Senate races. That was the year that was. It left a legacy. The legacy still enjoyed by some people today, 55 years later, Medicare. Uh, a number of the uh, other things in the Great Society have been uh, eroded or chipped away over the years. Well, thank you, Mary Grace, for inviting me. Thank you to the people who are here. If anybody has any questions, I am here to take the questions or comments. I am here to take the questions or comments.